All right, everyone, we are well into June, almost July of 2020. It's been a crazy ride. Welcome to the Fortify Your Data podcast. Uh, you're back here with Michael Hudak, uh, and I'm here with Josh Fisher and Ning Wang. Um, you guys are working on a book right now, uh, Grokking Streaming Systems. Uh, it's currently up on manning.com under a meet program, so you can start reading it now. I did not read all the available chapters. I read the first two. Uh, but before we get into all that, I wanted to give, uh, you know, Josh and Ning a chance to introduce themselves. We'll start with, uh, by order of who joined this chat. So Josh, if you want to go ahead and give us a little bit about yourself, your background. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so my name is Josh Fisher, located in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I've been doing software development for about five, six years or so. Um, I, um, you know, the whole process that got me into this book was, you know, just trying to figure out how systems work. You know, I started as an Android developer, got into APIs, uh, got into a little bit of automation on, you know, the DevOps system tooling side. And then I kind of fell into this Apache Heron project for at least working with it. And uh, because of that, you know, working with Ning, um, things kind of naturally came to be. And, you know, here we are today. Hi, uh, my name is Ning Wong. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, also a software engineer. Uh, in the Bay Area, so like uh, many other uh, software engineers. So I was, I'm at uh, uh, Amplitude uh, working on some data pipeline stuff. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, uh, Josh and I worked on working, or working on like a fun project, Amplitude Hero, and uh, we're happy to have this uh, opportunity to uh, write a book about streaming systems. Uh, it's a fun right for us as well as a like first time writer so a lot of things yep no i get it uh so as i was uh as i was starting to dig into it it was very clear that uh again not being a software developer i'm like ah okay you know there's there are a couple things that i had to like uh brush up on uh in, in relation to just some basic concepts but the book was very nice to give me this little snail that kind of told me what I was doing, a little graphic guy that kind of edits it in and says, hey, you know, what you currently need to, you know, look up or what this is referring to is this term. Uh, so that was helpful. But I am, I am a technical person uh, doing a lot with like networking, cybersecurity. So it, it's, it is, it is a, a reasonable read. But what made you think to uh, like write a book on this? What was the initial inspiration? Um, so... About a year ago, or even more than a year ago since this started, um, I was contacted by uh, Michael Stevens from Manning, and we started having a conversation about how Heron worked, you know, and he was, we were talking about writing a book on Heron and, um, you know, just getting into the details of how the system worked. And what the outcome of that conversation was is that, you know, probably the bigger more uh, interesting book to write is how do streaming systems actually work or what do you use them for? Because if you don't understand how or what the tool does, how can you use it? And um, so we started off um, with focus on Heron, but we, we decided to reach a broader audience um, by going the framework agnostic way. So um, we we're very lucky to, um, I was very lucky to have Ning partner up with me and um, because of the, you know, because of teaching streaming systems in a framework agnostic way has not been an easy task. You know, how do you, how do you pull away all the details and abstract away something and teach it with concepts that's easily transferable to, um, to any framework. And um, because of that, we're hoping to target readers who are, you know, a couple of years in with a little bit of experience that can hopefully, you know, start to get their feet wet with any streaming system. Yeah. Uh... The same, like uh, like what Josh said. Uh, another another reason is uh, there are many there are already many books uh, in this area. Uh, the major, but most of them are like based on one uh, specific technology. So I don't want to give us some examples here. Uh, that's maybe a bit much. Uh, but most of them like realize also on the technology itself. So when like we, we have a lot, there are a lot of concepts, but uh, they may be different uh, on different systems or different engines or frameworks. And uh, it is a, not really an easy task for people if they know, okay, I just want to use this one, how to use this technology. But then when they go to the other one, 
they have something new to learn or something may work differently. Uh, and uh, we couldn't find a book. We couldn't find a book like uh, talking about just basic concepts. So this may be a good topic for us. Uh, so it was quickly changed to this direction from the initial idea, I, I feel. Yeah, and so what what are some like basic like like just like what are like what's the first concept that you always try to like uh hammer into people's heads when they're asking you about this? It's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, where where do you start? I guess is another way to word it. <laughs> yeah, I, from my perspective is is what is it what is it that we're actually doing, right? You know, um when you know from I think if I think about my experience in getting started with Heron, it was such a big thing to learn a big system, all these different concepts, you know, that Ning was talking about is that it's, it's, it's an overflood of information um, that is really hard to narrow down on what you need to do. And I think the first thing is to understand why, like, why would you ever want to use a system like this? And um, I think in the simplest case, you know, is you want to show how to move data from one point to another continuously and then understand some of the problems, pros and cons with that, with that implementation. And uh, I guess from that, you gave a couple examples in the book. And I remember uh, like it, within the first chapter, and I'm trying to remember and I'm failing, but I remember all bank transactions is one of those continuous, uh, continuous uh, exchanges almost that never really has an end. Uh, and the the next thing that I kind of thought of was well, kind of the the Bitcoin ledger is kind of in a similar boat, right? Uh, is it something that you got that that comes across or laps on your shores as far as that, or you got guys try to stay away from like the crypto guys? <laughs> Ning, you want to take that? Ah, uh, <clears throat> hard question. Uh, we also have uh, I think we have a good like a uh, editor helping us. Uh, we learned a lot of things from him. Uh, I think one thing is uh, better to have example, which is super easy for readers to understand, to like feel. And uh, crypto, uh, or this many other, there are so many things that can be used, uh, like this new technology can be used. But uh, uh, we are not really familiar enough to them, and uh, which could be a uh, same uh, barrier for readers. So that's why like, uh, we basically try to choose some like uh, easy to understand examples or stories to start with. So, so maybe that's too much for us to <laughs> use it, but who knows? Like uh, we have only like four chapters. Maybe, maybe there is, or there are a few like good cases for that kind of examples. So it's still possible it's just like, uh, they may need to understand better about this area. Well, you know, and Ning brings up a great point. Um, we're right, we've spent months, and I mean months, um, training and learning how to, you know, we've been trained by, um, you know, a leader in the, the book community, Burke Bates, and, and how to make these books as easily to digest as possible. You know, so we, we have to teach complex topics, but keep, teach them with simple to understand scenarios or use cases. And blockchain probably would, you know, there could be a scenario where it would fit, but it would probably be overwhelming to understand the scenario of why you'd want to fit a streaming system within the blockchain and then how you'd implement that, that solution into it. Right, right. No, that makes sense. Um, and you'd almost, you'd almost certainly have to go to something that wasn't uh, like Bitcoin. You had to go to something more like uh, Ethereum. Uh, something that had more dev tools built into it, which is a whole other, uh, you know, because they're like, well, I want a file coin. <laughs> that's a whole other black hole right 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 yeah no i get that but i, I would uh i would i would regret not trying to bring it up because that seemed like uh you know i i i've had a litany of uh crypto enthusiasts in my life uh for a long time now and if i didn't if i didn't at least bring it up because i'm like oh this is something that uh this is something that would lap on their shores so what kind of businesses do you think would benefit from these kind of streaming systems right now and what do you think, uh, what businesses do you think haven't adopted it yet that will soon? Oh, another, another tough question. Um, you know, from, from my perspective, any business can adopt a streaming system or a streaming architecture. It really depends on what the requirements or needs are. Um, 
I think one of the, you know, but we you know with every cool new technology, right, you get this, you get this whole new set of features, but then along with that whole new sets of features comes this whole new set of problems that you have to deal with that you didn't have to worry about before. Um, you know, the, the traditional, I shouldn't say traditional, but you know, RESTful API architectures, those are fairly straightforward. You send a request, you get a response and you're done. Um, and the nice thing between that request response model is it's, it's a con it, that contract gives your developer a guarantee that the stuff they sent to the remote server was successfully processed or not, as long as everything's coded correctly, right? You have that, that's that warm guarantee that, hey, I'm good and I can move on. Um, with streaming, it's more like a fire and forget. You just send stuff off and there's really no, I mean, you get a response that, you know, it's there, but you don't, processing takes a, takes a hold after the fact, you know, it gets put on a queue or some data store or, you know, some data silo somewhere and then it's picked up by a streaming engine. Um, so to kind of back, I guess I wandered there, to go back to your question is any organization that truly has a real time or near real time um, solution to fix a problem. And probably one of the most clear cut ones that, you know, we're working on in the book is um, credit card fraud detection, real time fraud detection. Um, I mean, there's probably hundreds of other scenarios, um, uh, you know, that, that are out there and Ning can probably give us a, a few more, but that's, that's the first one is because as you just want to be able to get results back as quickly as possible. And that's a perfect use case for streaming systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a uh, great, uh, great with Josh. Uh, the business is a little bit too, it's very different, like uh, this above my paycheck, something like that. Uh, this like streaming system basically is a tool for developers to solve like real problems. And uh, it's really uh, like many other things, just uh, it's really hard to say that it is for like this technology is for some specific like uh, business. It's more for the problems themselves. Like some problems, uh, this can be a really really powerful tool to solve some of the problems. And it all depends on the developer or engineer to decide okay which one I want to use to solve the problem. Like there are multiple ways. Uh, technically, they have their own trade offs. So this is just one tool, and uh, that's also another thing is they feel it's important for developers to understand like the basic concepts uh, first before making a decision and choosing the right framework to really use to really solve the problem. So uh, yeah, it's like based on the use case or scenarios, yeah, not business. It's uh, as long as you have, as long as you have a lot of data to process in like near real time, uh, then this is a uh, streaming system is a candidate for you to think about. Yeah, so uh, let me just, you know, I left a piece out. The engineer side of me says, we can do streaming for everything, right? Let's, mm -hmm. let's stream everything right now all the time and just get real time results. It'll be just a great thing. But then, you know, the more business side of things is, is does this really make sense? Um, and, my suggestion, at least um, to others, and, um, is try a simpler solution first. And when that fails, then you move into more of a streaming architecture if you need it. So start with RESTful API, start with a batch job. Um, start with something else that's simpler and easier to maintain um, for you and your team. And then when that doesn't work, that's when you take a step up to these bigger streaming systems. What makes a streaming system not necessarily uh, easier to maintain? Just just expertise? It's just something different, or is it is it is there more to it? Ning, you want to go? Okay. Um, yeah, I remember. I remember like once before in my life, a few years ago, like I was trying to improve a memory reduce job. Uh, API or the source code looks sim simple enough, straightforward, just one file, like uh, 100 lines of code, that's pretty much it. And I was thinking, okay, how difficult it is? I just, uh, it is a little bit too slow now, I need to improve the performance. And then it took me like a few weeks just to try to tweak here and there, but it didn't work because there are so many things hidden behind the scene, like uh, other than this one file, there is a whole big system. 
uh, streaming system is uh, like similar to me, like the, from the user's point of view, your, your code is fairly straightforward, just connect these two things, configure them, click start, and it works. But there are so many things under, under it's like, uh, yeah, there are so many things behind the scene, like working for you, other than your code. Uh, so I think this makes it really hard, make it difficult to operate. So you know, another way is it will be really helpful to know uh, how the underlying engine works in order to make your work, make your system more efficient and uh, operate, maintain your job. Yep. So, you know, there's, there's one thing I, th I, didn't, I didn't bring up I should have you know, mentioned is that one of the biggest changes in streaming systems you really have to worry about is something called delivery semantics. Um, you know, again, you know, you go back to that RESTful API, you send a request off, it does some stuff, it comes back with a response, you know that that request was received or failed, um, you know, or processed. And typically, most of the time, um, there's not an issue with repeating that request. You know, it gets processed one time and it's done. Um, in streaming systems, it's possible that you can play the same transaction or event that goes into the system more than one time uh, based on the, the delivery semantic you pick. And examples of delivery semantics are um, at most once, which means a transaction can be processed maybe one time, or you can process it at least once, which means it'll be processed more than one time. And then there's also the, um, the, the last one, which is really held up in glory, which is exactly once. Or, um, and that is saying that we, we guarantee that this, this streaming system will process a transaction exactly one time, or really give the illusion of processing a transaction one time. Because it's in any distributed system, it's, I would say it's impossible to guarantee that you can process a transaction exactly one time with all these distributed nodes across um, several physical machines. Okay, and so then my follow-up question to that would be, how would you, if you were currently using a RESTful API that wasn't, wasn't cutting it, how do you sell it to your uh, business leaders who might not be technically savvy? How are you saying like, hey, this is what we need. We need to switch it up. These are the, this is, uh, this is what it's gonna take. This is why we're gonna do it. How do you, how do you push that forward? Or how do, you, how do you get that pushed through from a business sense? I think that's really getting into more of the financial side of things. You know, okay. what's developer cost? What's developer productivity on debugging this issue? You know, how much, how much is this issue causing our business money? Mm -hmm. And then you gotta, and then you gotta calculate. Okay, what's the offset going to be to implement the streaming system? How much is that going to cost? And then how much will that um, investment be chunked off with improvements? Or you know, um, how much of that investment will be cut down by the efficiency of developers moving forward? You know, that really gets into the financial side of things where you really got to break stuff down on a spreadsheet, um, mm -hmm. probably work with a product manager. Um, you know, really got to put stuff together from a critical financial perspective to really make sense of what, what it is you want to do. No, that, that's well put. That's, that's definitely the correct answer. <laughs> Uh, as far as like uh, general industry expertise, how many people do you think there are that are masters of implementing streaming systems? Uh, you know, okay. there's probably quite a few good people out there. Okay. Uh, and it's growing every single day. Um, as over the years, as systems have grown, you know, just like any tech now, new technology that comes out, when they come out, they're extremely hard to use, and they're still fairly hard to use. But as adoption rises, people contribute to it, the things become easier, and then people, it becomes easier to learn and understand. Um, I'd say that anybody has the ability to become, you know, a master, as we say, as long as they take the time uh, to invest in it and really learn how things work under the covers. What do you think, Nate? Yeah. Uh, my answer could be simple. Uh, there could be more. Okay. <laughs> Very <laughs> diplomatic answers. Uh, so I, I, I guess that's, that's my piece because I've, I've met a lot of, uh, you know, I meet a lot of tech guys in general and uh, very, I, this might, you might be the two first people that are really flying the streaming systems flag. Um, and that's why, that's why it's like, all right, well, this is one, it's interesting, it's different, but also why. 
why is that number so low? Just because it's new or because it's difficult? Both. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the probably the easiest, um, most straightforward answer is it's, well, there's three P's, you know, you difficult, it's new, and then you got to justify it to the business. Mm -hmm. um, typically, streaming systems will cost more to run than your typical stateless API because there's always something running in the background. Um, usually they, um, they could take up more cores than your typical, you know, RESTful API. You know, there's a lot of stuff running in the background to make sure all this stuff works efficiently. That makes sense. Ning, you had some. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think from the other side is uh, there are there's so many things for engineers to work on, uh, and uh, this is streaming system, like uh, other data processing systems. Uh, they are kind of one specific case of uh, the technologies of engineers can use. Uh, so it's more also about the opportunity, like, uh, okay, you have really a good, exactly oh, a suitable problem to solve, and you have the chance to have the, you have the option to choose these uh, streaming systems to solve your problem. And uh, I think this is not like uh, a uh, general, like background, uh, backend service. Okay, I need this service, let's, let's do it. That's a simple, easy. Uh, and then you're going, you're going to start it. Like for me, it's the same. Okay, we, I, we need to have a backend service. Uh, and then I just okay, start to work on the service side before I was more for the client side. So it's easy, but for a streaming system or data processing system, you'll have, there are some more requirements. So especially in real life, not a personal project, there's some requirement to enter the, uh, the field. Uh, so this is, uh, so it's just life. It's nothing, it's never, never like a equal. Yeah, that's my feeling. No, I'm that makes, <laughs> yeah, I guess, are there any, like, I guess as far as like industry adoption, are there, um, are there like conferences specific to this this kind of uh, you know streaming system, or is there are there conferences based on like hey is there like a Huron conference? Is there like a is there something is there is there widespread industry support for this or no? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, so the bigger companies are really the ones getting into streaming right now because one, it's more costly, and two, it requires a different type of thinking. But you can look up any big data, um, you can look up any O'Reilly big data conference or um, you can look up any, anything that has to do with machine learning or anything these days and you're gonna find streaming in there somewhere. It's, um, it's definitely becoming more required. Well, I shouldn't say required, more wanted, mm -hmm. um, but isn't necessarily required. You know, you, you really, and you know, to really justify your use of a streaming system, in my scenario, you know, my thinking is that you really have to fail first before you bring that complexity in. Yeah, it is just the one piece in the big data domain. Uh, so I think it's, uh, there may not be a uh, like specific conference for streaming systems, but uh, it is part of uh, the others like uh, VLDB, like Sigma, uh, so there should be like quite some streaming, some uh, technologies or papers about streaming systems in that conference. That makes sense. Do you, um, going back to something you said a while ago, uh, as far as detecting fraud, um, do you consider this to be, uh, or like when you're pitching this, do you consider this to be part of like a cybersecurity solution? Uh, or do you guys do you guys think that it's ever marketed that way, or do you think that this is just kind of something in and of itself? This isn't really a cybersecurity play. It could be, um, you know, if you wanted to, you know, if you wanted to use streaming to, to monitor network logs, you could, you know, you could probably plug a streaming system up and, um, you know, have a data source as your network logs, and then you know, make some decisions, detect some anomalies there if you really wanted to, uh, but. And then it all goes back to, have we failed yet? Okay. You know, it's... Yeah. This requires... Uh, 
the same thing, like deciding to use streaming systems or not, that's, uh, that's the first question. And uh, it's also depends on the requirements, like what do you really need and uh, uh, what is really the problem to solve. So it's if the general service solves your problem well, then there may not be a need. Uh, or if you want to improve one specific area and uh, it's not suitable for like other options, uh, so this is also a tool available. What's like an anecdotal story, I guess, of a spot where you guys were looking at it and you guys were like, you know what, what we're doing right now makes more sense. Do you guys have something that you've either heard of or experienced where you guys were thinking about implementing it or uh, kind of putting that square peg in a round hole and then you said, you know what, it's fine the way it is right now? <laughs> So for my scenario, I, um, I, speci I specifically worked on a fraud detection uh, project. Mm -hmm. um, you had to, you know, dynamically detect, you know, criteria from the credit card, you know, and then dynamically create a job based on the criteria from the credit card swipe. And then, you know, run a bunch of rules and say, is this, um, is this transaction potentially fraudulent or not? Um, we went with streaming because it had an SLA that was so low or service, you know, it, we had to respond with the result within like 25 milliseconds. Okay. You know, we really had to execute fast. And even that 25 millisecond boundary was really pushing the ability for the streaming system to keep up because it was that fast or it needed to be that fast. So in, in my example that, or in my case, that seemed like a great reason to use a streaming system. Yeah, this is a hard question. Uh, it's really, <laughs> we're basically going to specific uh, use cases. And uh, uh, my feeling is really depends on the requirements. So the, often, even the, it is the same problem, like multiple options, they are all like, a, they're all valid. It's just like a, your decision and uh, which one you feel, what do you feel is more important. Like the example, just the example, uh, detection is, you can do whatever you want to detect this like uh, something you want to find out. But because of these specific requirements, then like the streaming system becomes the more suitable way than like the general backend service because of this one and also you are the latency is the overall latency, not like uh, every single one has to be the same or has to wait for each other. But that's quite different. It really depends on what you need or what you want. Well, you know, we can also get into some more fun scenarios and I don't want to put you in the spot um, But, you know, so here on the project we work on uh, came out of Twitter. Okay. Uh, so Twitter had this back end. They had this whole streaming back end with uh, Apache Storm. Um, I think they had some debugging issues or profiling issues with, you know, trying to maintain the system during, you know, running. And I'm speaking from an outsider perspective here. Um, but so that was the reason Heron was built. And, you know, if, I don't know if you're ever on Twitter and you see like likes automatically increase right in front of you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's more, you know, I'm speaking from outside the box and completely ignorant here, but that would be a good use case for a streaming system because you have to update that thing right as it's ready to go. Mm -hmm. You know, so really give people those real-time results on whatever it is they need. So it could be as something as complex as fraud detection, or it could be as something as simple as showing real-time updates of likes for a Twitter post. Yeah, okay, that's a good way to put it. Um, I wonder I wonder if that's already being implemented, you know? I wonder if, uh, if everyone on the Twitter ends like, you know what we're going to do for these likes? Streaming systems. You think that's being <laughs> talked about? Uh, yeah, I guess I cannot comment on it. <laughs> Since, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, I, I worked at Twitter before, uh, I'm it here, so uh, I feel like a little cautious to answer the questions like that. Yeah, no, yeah, I get it. Yeah, but there are, yeah, there are many like streaming jobs running yeah. to solve. Yes, so, problems. so just so you know, Ning is modest. He was a core developer on the Heron system while at Twitter. So he built okay. basically the, the real-time architecture that Twitter sits upon right now. 
Okay. That's fantastic. Yeah. Very, uh, very humble. Yes. But uh, I get it. Uh, people like a humble guy. Um, I guess as we, I guess my, my final questions are really more towards like, what do you, I guess being on more of the development side of the spectrum, what are your thoughts on what's happening now with the 5G starting to get to most major cities uh, build out? Do you think that's sh shaping uh, your life in a more meaningful way than just faster internet? That is a good question. I'll, I'll, I'll give you my answer to it while you guys think about it. Cause it's, uh, it's, it's allowing uh, me on the, on the, on the data center side to do a lot more just in terms of, you know, pushing data back and forth with like backups, things like that, or local backups and with edge computing. Uh, but honestly, it's not as profound as I thought it would be. You know, I get it. I get it's very early and especially, you know, in, in more Midwestern cities, but um for as many people that were telling me that there are 5G death towers, now, of course, those are the same people who told me there are 4G death towers. Uh, I, I guess I'm just, I'm amazed that, like, I, I, it's, not, it's not that profound um, of a difference. And I think it's because we don't really have a good use case for it. And I was going to pick your brains on that. But I was curious, first, how has 5G changed, or if you guys have interfaced with it at all, how, how has it been changing how you guys develop or at all, if it has? hasn't affected me yet. Okay. Yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm a I'm a slow adapter to the to the new things. Uh, especially since they could be like often they could be like pricey or more. I don't know. Anyways, I I prefer hold a little bit and wait. I'm not really like want to jump in jump to this fancy new thing like immediately. Uh, for yeah so my life is still the same mm -hmm. so far who knows well, you know he brings up a great point you know because you know you both said you know ning said he's slow to adopt and you said 5g isn't as great as it was or you thought it was going to be yeah and it's just like any new technology that comes out it's hard to use when it originally comes out you know because innovation comes at a cost it really does you know to do something new you really got to get out there and you got to get wild and you got to get uncomfortable to get stuff working and Typically, the first few rounds um, aren't the easiest. And my adoption of, of that um, hasn't come, you know, hasn't come to my life yet because there's only so many fire hoses I can drink out of from one time. I pick and choose my battles right now. I get it. I guess I just, I'm trying to figure out what the use case, like what the, the business use cases are aside from things being faster. You know, it's, it's not freeing up a lot as much as I thought it was going to be. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to, yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't understand what it would, you know, what the business use cases would be. I think it would require some drinking from the fire hose, maybe. Yeah, right, right. But I'm just, yeah, I'm not there yet. Good. It will, I, show, it will show up yeah. eventually. <laughs> right. Well, I think, that, I think it's just going to be this gradient where, like, we don't notice it as much. But I remember, like, moving away from dial up, it was just night and day. And, you know, I feel like now, uh, you know, even just looking at something as simple as like computer specs, computer, like the amount of RAM computers come with really hasn't changed that profoundly in the last 10 years compared to like from 1990 to 2005, you know, when we were going from like 64 megs to, you know, two gigs, you know, that's significant, but I'm still seeing laptops being rolled out with like eight gigs of RAM, four gigs of RAM. So maybe it's just we've hit a point where we're just not we're not consuming it as much as uh, or those those growths we don't know what to do with it. There's only so many uh, so many high resolution photos we can send back and forth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think devices or computers. Let's say devices, since computers are like a general term these days. Devices will be more connected, and uh, this kind of new connections can be can change our life. Yeah, uh, quite a bit, but that's just the the future is there, yeah. and uh, it's like the dream. Yeah, I believe that. I mean, a lot of people don't have uh, laptops anymore or desktops even, unless yeah. they're in tech. Obviously, you know, I do, and I assume you guys both do. If you didn't, I'd be a little concerned. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but like I know a lot of people that just don't. You know, they're just uh, they just. I don't know what they do. Like sales guys uh, run around and they just have their phone and that's it. They're happy with it. So, well, you, know, you bring up a very, you know, an interesting point is um, I was talking to uh, a mentor of mine, you know, the guy who 
dealt with me from the very beginning of my you know, development career and has been putting up with me since. You know, he is one of the most talented people I've ever worked with. And usually anything he says, I, you know, I, I listen to him. He told me that, you know, all the changes that Apple's making with all these web-based IDEs and um, there's this new web-based Eclipse ID that he's thinking about switching to a, to a, um, to an iPad to do, do development and, you know, just do it all remote on the cloud somewhere. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hard to, hard to imagine like five years ago. That's very true. That's very true. Well, there's some people that are still like, ah, oh, that's probably a bad example. But yeah, there, there's there's a lot of people that are that are just uh, com just just want to get away from the laptop or away from the desktop entirely. We have, uh, you know, we have uh, I have customers that I support that are like, uh, well, with the coronavirus uh, epidemic or pandemic, I would like to uh, have everyone use tablets, and I'm like, well. I don't know if everyone would like to use tablets, <laughs> you know, like I, I get that you could like attach a mouse and a keyboard to it, but I think that, you know, short term laptops might still be, you know, useful. Just take them home. Yeah. So. At this point in time, I love my laptop. I love my, you know, four to eight core selection, you know, and I'm good. I don't want to know. I, that's, that's a good way to put it though at this point in time, because for the longest time I actually resisted smartphones because they didn't have a physical keypad keypad. And so oh, yeah. there was one, there was one smartphone that still had a keypad and then they got rid of it. And I went back to like one of those sliders for a minute. Cause I was like, I'm not, I'm not dealing with no touchpad. And now I can't imagine using those tiny buttons. again. Yeah. Yeah. I was a slow adopter of the, of the touchpad as well. Yeah. The, <laughs> took me a long time. I fought it. Yeah. It's just one of those things where I was like, this isn't, this isn't going to work for me. This isn't going to work for me, chief. Give me a keyboard. And I was trying to find like these like third party, like external keyboards for your phone. And uh, it just, it just looked, it made me look stupid, like looking back at it. But I remember how against that I was at the time. So hey, software keyboard was not as good as like these days uh, yeah. back then. So I think it's reasonable. Yeah. Don't, it's okay to believe in, it's okay to stand up for what you believe in. If that's a keyboard connected to a phone, you know, that's good. Well, I did, I did give up that battle, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> all right, I'm going to, we're, we're getting, we're getting a little distracted now, but uh, all right. So you, you wrote the book, I guess my final question to you is, or you're writing the book. What is, if, if, if there are like two or three things you get out of finishing the book, what do you hope those are? What do we get out of finishing a book or what does the reader get? Uh, what you want the reader to get and what you want to get both. My goal is that a reader could, a reader with a couple of years of experience of doing development in any language, hopefully. Um, some of our examples are in Java right now, but we may change that. Um, is that they can take a base knowledge of what they have on how APIs work and how communication works across um, APIs. Read that book and then know enough about streaming systems that they can go into an interview and get a job working on a streaming on, on, on a streaming architecture. So it's our goal is to allow the people to increase their skills to get a maybe a higher paying job or become more valuable in the market. My goal for the book is to be done with it. Because we've been writing it for a year and we got a ways to go. So it's um it's a lot of time. It's a lot of time at night. Um but it's it, it's worth it. It's 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 good to the reason why I say get done is because when we when we released those four chapters, it was like, you know, jump in the air, high five time, you know, because it was just, it was like that moment. And when the, when the time comes that the book gets done, it's going to be, um, it's going to feel good. Right. Uh, my answer from the reader side, uh, I think we have, uh, we're engineers. So there is a fairly popular concept, like feel fast. Uh, so my goal is for readers after he, they, read the book, uh, they know if they want to learn more or they, okay, that's enough. Uh, so let's save some time in their lives. So that uh, could be successful, uh, like helpful for people. And uh, since our goal is to make it easy to understand. So don't, they don't need to put too much effort just to, okay, spend like two months just to know, okay, I don't like it. So it's uh, maybe two weeks is enough to make the decision. You save one and a half. One and a half months. That's a big thing. 
uh, for myself. Uh, I think we have already got it later. Uh, from the editors, I think I have learned like a, writing a book or the book itself is basically a teaching thing, a teaching tool. And the teaching is hard. Uh, it's, it's really hard. I, uh, I think I was a fairly good student, but I was not expect, not respect my teachers enough. So now I feel their work is hard. Yeah. And uh, also teaching is important for everyone. So it's also a skill for everyone because we communication, telling other people what it is. Uh, I think this is an important skill for, for myself. And uh, yeah, I'm really glad to have this opportunity. But also, like George said, uh, a lot of effort there. But it's, uh, it's fun. Uh, it's hard, but it's fun. I get it. I could, I could definitely empathize with, uh, with you guys on that. Uh, the, before I did the podcast, I actually wrote the book Fortify Your Data. And it was such a process that I'm like, I don't want to ever write a book again. I'm going to do a podcast <laughs> instead. <laughs> Which is why this exists. Uh, I actually had more, like I, I, while I was writing that, I started writing another book on data privacy and I just, I just released it as a 40 page ebook. Cause I'm like, Nope. Yeah. <laughs> Not saying it's just, it's just, it's tough. Uh, it's, uh, it's like one of those, one of those things that like once you release it, you know, they'll be just, it's like once it's finalized and if you ever do like a print version, that's its whole thing. It's one of those things where I admire anyone. Uh, kind of like how uh, Ning felt about his teacher. I did not respect authors and publishers enough. Because there's just so many tiny like quirks and details. Um, yes. Yep. Yeah. We've been put through the gauntlet of training. I promise you. <laughs> That's good because I wasn't, and anyone that had like the very first printing of Fortify Your Data will recognize that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I get it. You know, I, I appreciate you guys taking the time to sit down. And uh, Manning Publish Publications uh, was kind enough. We have uh, we have some free ebook codes. We also have a permanent uh, forty percent off code. Um, the 40% off code will be in the uh, description on Spotify, uh, YouTube, DTube, wherever this, uh, wherever you're listening to this. Um, and then the five free ebook codes in two weeks, what I'm going to do is I'm going to raffle them off to people that are on the newsletter. Uh, what I would say is that if you are, if you get it and you're like a, if you're like a financial advisor that listens to this let me know and then I'll find like donate it to like a software development guy. Cause I think that I want this to get into the hands of people that are going to use it. Um, and then beyond that, if you are in software development and you want to get a hold of this book, you know, reach out to me and then fortify your data might donate some of those to you as well. So uh, as far as any closing notes go, you know, you, the floor is yours guys, any part and, you know, parting uh, comments. First off, let me start with thank you uh, for your time, Michael. This was, um, this was really fun. Um, that's all I got. I'm happy. Thank you. It's a good day. Yeah, yeah of course. Yep. Thank you. This is a uh, first, first time and also a different experience as well. Yep. Yeah. Good. And also yeah. thanks for our editors. Uh, we really learned a lot from him, uh, Bert. Yeah. 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 Anytime. Anything. Anything. And if once you guys are done, you know, we could have a post mortem podcast where we talk about <laughs> <laughs> being done with writing books and and all that kind of stuff. So you know, like I said, I appreciate it. And uh, for everyone uh, listening, I'm going to cut this off. So uh, well, I'll talk to you guys next time. Thanks, guys. <laughs>